Everyone, welcome. Uh, we want to welcome you today to the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice series. This is America, a series of conversations about racial slavery, its legacies, and anti-Black racism. My name is Nicole Gonzalez Van Cleve, and I'm an associate professor at Brown University in the Department of Sociology. Today, we are profiling a new book that has profound implications for how we think about punishment in America. Mass incarceration has an afterlife. While more people are incarcerated in the United States than any other nation in the history of the Western world, the prison is one, only one comparatively small institution in this vast carceral landscape. 19.6 million US adults are estimated to have a felony conviction. That's a population five times the size of the jail and prison census and four times the size of the population under probation and patrol, excuse me, parole. A staggering 79 million Americans have, an, have a criminal record, easily accessible by landlords, employers, licensing officials, and anyone really with, uh, and anyone really. The size of the U.S. carceral state is second in its consequence and reach. The accused are greeted by 48,000 laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that limit their participation in labor and the housing markets, its culture and civic life in the city, and even within their families. Today, we are going to talk about an important book called Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration, published by Little Brown and Company. We are joined by the author, Professor Ruben Jonathan Miller. He's an assistant professor at the University of Chicago School of Social Service and Administration. His research examines life at the intersections of race, poverty, and crime control and social welfare policy. His first sole authored book, Halfway Home, is based on 15 years of research and practice with currently and formerly incarcerated men, women, their families, partners, and friends. Dr. Miller has conducted field work in Chicago, Detroit, and New York, examining how law policy and emergent practices of the state and third party supervision has changed the contours of citizenship, activism, community, family life for poor black Americans and the urban poor more broadly. He is currently conducting research on the moral worlds of people who've been deemed violent and will launch a comparative study of punishment and social welfare policy in port cities where the most involved that were most involved in the transatlantic slave trade. So his work is moves beyond the United States and into Europe. He's a native son of Chicago Southside and he received his PhD from Loyola University Chicago. We are also joined by Ronald Simpson Bay who works as the director of outreach reach and alumni engagement for JLUSA and is the 2015 leading with Conviction Fellow. He is a national decarceration leader committed to cutting the number of people under carceral supervision by half by 2030. Mr. Simpson Bay does policy and advocacy work in, Michigan collabor in the Michigan Collaborative to End Mass Incarceration and community organizing with the Nation Outside Organization for Returning Citizens. He is the co-founder and advisory board member of Chance for Life, an organization in Detroit, Michigan. He served 27 years in a Michigan prison system on a wrongful conviction case. While inside, Mr. Simpson Bay became a legal advocate, filing and leading as a pro se attorney some of the largest class action lawsuits against the Michigan Department of Corrections. Mr. Simpson Bay took on the state again and reversed his own conviction, one of a few jailhouse lawyers to free himself. Today, Mr. Simpson Bay is a leading advocate working to dismantle mass incarceration and reverse its many harms. I want to thank you both for joining us here at Brown University. This is just such an honor and joy for me. And I am, you know, I say this, uh, uh, you know, I joke with uh, Professor Miller, he was just on fresh air, but a couple days ago. So I am so glad I booked this prior to that appearance because um, I don't know, I, I hope we would have gotten you, but it's a joy to have you both here. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Gonzalez Van Cleef for the invitation. Uh, uh, Nicole is my dear, dear sister. Um, and I just, I just appreciate you very much for, for making space uh, for well, we want to start, if you could do a reading from the book to just give a sense of what the book is about or in some of the words that you've written, we'd love to start start with your words. 
Yeah, of course. No, happy to, happy to. Uh, and, and and also shout out to my brother, Ronald Simpson Bay, um, who, who I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, in a hot second. But this, so so the, the book is about the, the, the the transformation of, of American social life that happens in the wake of mass incarceration. And so the, the argument of the book is that, you know, our experiment in human cage in 27 straight years of, 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 of incarcerating more people at a higher rate beginning in 1972 uh, and, and moving forward for 27 straight years and the targeting of uh, uh, poor people of color, specifically black men uh, for incarceration so much so that, that, that we're incarcerating groups uh, 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 rather than individuals, is of course the definition of mass incarceration. That what that has done uh, is, is is that has transformed the social life of the city. That that, that we live in effectively a very different place. That, that the contours of the American Democratic Project are also vastly different. And so I'm going to read from you from 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 chapter three, a chapter called Center Man, uh, to, to to set the stage for our conversation. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, my dear brother Ronald, who's 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 on with us. Uh, so so. Uh, this is from chapter three, and you're gonna meet someone named Jimmy. I started research in Detroit in January of 2014, splitting my time between the detention center and the reentry center. I visited twice a week. One guard at the desk would make a call and another would escort me into the facility. We go from bullpen to bullpen and I get to pitch my wares to a dozen or so men who were standing around or lying on benches or if it was early and crowded enough, lying on the floor. Listen up, guys, the officer would shout to, them to get the men's attention, and I'd introduce myself. I'd explain my study, and most men would just sign up. I suspect because I offered them a three-day bus pass and, promised to, uh, and a promise for compensation for their time. After that, I'd walk over to the women's side, meet a new guard, and repeat the process. Sometimes I'd wait with the family members who were there to pick up their loved ones. Sometimes I'd head to the muster room, the cell where people who were about to be released waited for the final buzzer, and the final gray steel and plexiglass door to slide open. They didn't know that their loved ones were on the other side of that door eating overpriced concessions, waiting for them to pick them up. I took down the names of the people in that cell and the names of people who could reach them. Most times I'd have the attention of the men who sat there waiting for their release. Other times I'd have to compete with whatever was happening on the yard, which they could see right outside the window or the conversations they were having about their plans or the papers they held with their conditions of release and instructions for the next step. Then the steel door would buzz and slide open for their reunion with their loved one who was waiting for them to come home. A father would hug his boy close. A grandmother would reach up from her seat to embrace her long since grown child, her walker between them. Children weren't often there, but there was always some exchange between the people released from their cages and the people who picked them up, even when they were in a hurry to leave. There'd be some intimate conversation or just a few words between each parent, maybe a nod or glance or eyes that dance nervously from a lover to the floor, or maybe a parent would acknowledge how much a child had grown since their last transfer. All of it signaling that a loved one was known and cared for, even if he made a mistake, and even if she hadn't visited in some time. Some people made a beeline for the exit, their loved ones trailing close behind, but the relief on their faces when that last door buzzed was almost always the same. They had been in prison, but now they were on their way home. Taking in this scene, I almost missed Jimmy Caldwell, who walked out of the detention center alone. It took four tries for me to reach Jimmy. The call dropped twice, then his phone was out of service. After a few days, I got a hold of his mother. She was warm and passed along the message, and Jimmy called back within a few hours. He showed up early and had a cup of coffee in the waiting area of the University of Michigan's Detroit Center in Midtown while I finished an interview with a woman who I'd met at the detention center the week before. Everyone who met Jimmy commented on how nice he was. He was a stocky man, but appeared somehow vulnerable, hanging on your every word as if it mattered in some profound way. He was five foot 10, but seemed short. He smiled easily and joked often, but not so much that you didn't take him seriously. And while he looked at you directly when he talked, he never made eye contact. I invited him from the table where he was drinking coffee with lots of cream and sugar to the room where we'd have our first interview. And Jimmy moved quickly. We covered the basics in short order. He had a 10th grade education and had been arrested at least 20 times. This started when he was 16. High school was hard. He tried job corps, but it wasn't for him. He sold dope, used dope, and went to prison for property crimes. After a three year sentence for grand larceny, he finished a six month drug treatment program. He was happy about completing treatment and used lots of treatment language. He talked about people, places, and things, and 
codependence and enablers and my madness and my disease. I wondered about his life, but I needed to get beyond the things he'd learned to say in treatment groups and beyond the stories you hear about when you watch black gangster movies from the 1990s like the hard and tragic life of violence and addiction that poor black kids are presumed to find themselves in every day. Black life in cities like Detroit has been so caricatured and these caricatures have led to bad policy, welfare reform, the war on drugs, the war on crime, a million mentorship programs that try to replace missing black fathers. Despite two decades of research that show black fathers are there, that black fathers help with homework and go to games and share moments of affection like all fathers. In fact, Black fathers spend more time with their children than fathers from any other racial group, even when they have multiple children, and even when those children have different mothers. This is what social scientists call family complexity. But the news about exceptional Black men who teach low-income kids complicated handshakes and YouTube clips of white principals doing the latest dances with little Black girls and boys, and viral videos of police officers playing basketball with kids in dreadlocks, and memes where a hundred black men show up for the first day of school, a prominently displayed caption beneath like real fathers or real black men. This convinces us that this is abnormal. And there's not just bad policy. Lessons from a thousand studies on missing black men and a thousand more on what sociologists call social disorganization show up in the first interview. So do slogans that moralize black life along with phrases like, you know how we are and some version of what our people really need to do is. And they're the things that preachers and pundits and presidents say at gatherings of black men. All of this typically comes up with the first hour of the interview. Social scientists might call this social desirability bias, meaning people tell you the stories they think you wanna hear. And there are interview techniques to get past all of this, but it takes a while to move beyond the noise in people's heads. And it takes more than a few hours and a few cups of coffee to really learn about someone's life. I had a plan. I would ask Jimmy about his family and about what it was like for him to grow up on the east side of Detroit. I'd ask him about how the city had changed since the last time he was locked up. And I'd ask what it was like for him to come home. Um, I'm the only boy, he said quickly, confidently. He had four sisters. When I asked where he was in the pecking order, he sat up in his chair laughing. I'm the baby. You're the baby, I said, thinking I knew what he meant. When I told him, I'm the baby too, we laughed together, loudly, two middle-aged men sitting in an office in Midtown, decades removed from my childhood, thinking about some pleasant thing from so long ago. But Jimmy stopped laughing abruptly. I was surprised by how quiet he got and how quickly the mood changed. He wiped his eyes, sighed, leaned his head on his hand. So he took a long pause, tears started to stream down his cheeks. I was kind of spoiled. I got pretty much everything I wanted, 30 seconds of silence. Jimmy was full on crying now no longer bothering to wipe his face. His dim brown eyes and red, his, and, and red, red and full, his voice soft and broken, he went on. So when crack came, it was a lot of disappointment, I being the only boy. Is that why you're upset, I asked? What a dumb question. I didn't really know what to say. There was a grown man crying in my office. I handed him the box of tissue we kept for times like this and sat with him in silence. It's not where I wanna be right now, he whimpered after a while. My sisters, they getting there. It's getting there, you know. I wanted to know more. He told me his sisters had helped raise him and that they were close growing up. He told me he wanted to keep it that way, but that's not how things turned out. Everybody kind of looked up to me, he explained, back to wiping the sides of his face. Like I said, it was a lot of disappointment. Time after time, they give me the benefit of the doubt. Basically, I shit on them. What about your parents, I asked, trying to find my bearings. Well, my father, he was married, but he wasn't married to my mom. I got four sisters, Jimmy said, explaining they were his half sisters. That is, they were not all his father's biological children. His mother had children from a previous relationship and his father had a family of his own. He took care of two families, Jimmy said. He treated all my sisters like they were his. He go home, but I seen my daddy every day. Were you close, I asked. Yeah, we was close at the time, he said. Jimmy's father died when Jimmy was young. Cancer, it was 82 or 83. He said, Jimmy was just starting high school then. He was 14 and at a new school with a mother raising five children on her own. Things started getting different. I don't know if it was because my mother didn't really know how to raise a boy. I was the baby, so if I want it, I'ma tell my daddy and I get it, he said. But after my father died, I stopped getting all the perks, Jimmy said. 
Jimmy's father was an auto worker. At a time when people still had pensions, his mother made Jimmy and his four sisters take their dead father's last name to ensure that they would be taken care of financially, in Jimmy's words. But there were no more perks other than the few hundred dollars that came in the mail each month from the Social Security office. And that went to Jimmy's mother. Jimmy's father, the man who Jimmy saw every day, the one who took care of his sisters as if they were his own, was gone. I want to wear all the good shit like I've been wearing, Jimmy said, but it wasn't that kind of party. It felt like everyone was against me, so I started doing dumb shit. Jimmy would wait for the mailman to come each month. I figured, well, that's my check. I should be able to do with it what I want. That's my money. And I wouldn't think about bills or none of that, he told me, reflecting on his route into trouble. This was the reasoning of a 14-year-old, one who didn't realize that the mailman was delivering his check but that the place where his father developed cancer might have some responsibility toward his family. And it wasn't just his family. Cancer rates among black auto workers rival rates in the famed Cancer Alley, that 85 mile stretch along the Mississippi River of petroleum refineries and chemical plants that claim the lives of a generation of black men. Auto workers were dying, leukemia, colon and pancreatic cancers, lung cancer, cancer of the stomach, cancer of the liver, brain cancer, cancers of all kinds claim the lives of so many black people in Detroit. I started to steal, he said. Like me and other guys in the neighborhood, when the mailman come, we take the mail, tried to cash the checks ourselves. A whole group of boys had lost their fathers to the auto plant. The same plants that convinced the government to use eminent domain to demolish 1,500 homes in Detroit on the promise of good jobs in the 1980s. The same plants provided just a fraction of those jobs, then packed up and left. The same auto plants did not cut checks to the boys' families, but had went to the Capitol with their caps in their hands during the Great Recession to ask the government for a check. Those same plants got checks. Those boys' families got no checks. Jimmy and his friends stole the meager Social Security check the state sent to their mothers but that plan didn't work, Jimmy said. No one would cash the check. So there the boys were, their names on checks their dead fathers had earned with no way to access the funds. That's when I left high school, he said. The rest of the story is predictable. Jimmy ran the streets, stole, started selling dope. By 16, he was using. By 17, he'd been to jail. By 18, he was in prison. He lied to his family and lost jobs. He stole things from people's homes. He used more drugs and did time over and over again, six months for stealing car radios, 12 months for drug distribution, 18 months for grand larceny, dozens of arrests for trespassing, for using, for stealing scrap metal, for not reporting to his parole officer on time when he was high. Then he stayed with his sisters in between bids. He loved his nieces and nephews having no children of his own and he spent much of what of the time he could. And the kids wrote to Jimmy while he was locked up sending pictures and visiting as often as they could, but over time, he became more difficult to support. He would disappear for months at a time, then call collect when he ran out of money or knock on their door when he got out of jail. When he showed up again, the kids were older and he was older too. He was middle-aged now and the kids had grown and they had lives of their own. And despite the challenges and the separations he felt, he was proud of them. He had nieces and nephews who had graduated high school and gotten married. One was about to sign a record deal. Wow, I said, happy to hear the news. As Jimmy Beam talking about the kids, I want to end the interview here. At a high point, the things took another turn. He put his head down and teared up again. What makes you sad about that, I asked, surprised at the sudden shift. I don't know, he took a breath. I guess, I guess I'm happy on that part. His voice breaking, Jimmy said, but it's hard. I look at myself and all the potential that I had, or I let myself down, and I feel like, wow. I got left behind. I understood. Stop there. That was just uh, so beautiful and profoundly uh, just striking that you can create such a beautiful narrative, but also tragic narrative about structural racism. I think I, I, the links together, I think a lot of times we have trouble seeing the cascading effects of racism along different um, metrics, everything from housing into environmental racism into, um, and I, you know, it's palpable. And I, and I think one of the things that you do so well um, is bring narrative life 
to the subjects that you are studying and talking to. I mean, it's not studying. I, it almost, that almost diminishes what you're doing. You're giving narrative life to the a person that's truly suffered and that we need to see. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'd love for Ron to talk a little bit about, you know, your experience of, of this narrative, uh, uh, both the, the side of, the in, of inequality that Ruben is kind of reading through this character of Jimmy, but also how you see it within the advocacy work that you do, Ron. Thank you for having me. I'd like to first, you know, give honors and thanks to you guys for hosting this, this wonderful event. My good friend, my brother Ruben, who actually, you know, he is the, the foundation of this event with that amazing book that he wrote and he had the uh, wherewithal to include me in it. I feel honored and I, and I thank him for including me. Um, you talked about the narrative that he weaved. I mean, he does such a masterful job at doing it because the narrative in our community, unless you live in our community, it's hard to understand what the narrative, especially the way that Ruben matter of factly puts it, because we live it every day. So it's kind of like, it's like being a rose. You don't understand how beautiful you are, what the smell is that you exude because you live in it. Mm -hmm. So when Ruben weaves it, he when he weaves these narratives around the characters in his book, then they're not just characters. Like you said, it wasn't an interview. He was talking about their lives. He was interacting with them on a relationship level. I was talking about putting the humanity back into being human. He related to them as being human and not just somebody that was been in prison, returning back to the community and getting ready to, to suffer, you know, whatever indignations and harms you're going to suffer from being in jail and in prison. And so from my perspective, the work that I do, you know, I, I work for Just Leadership USA. We are a national a criminal justice reform organization committed to cutting the prison population and to elevate the voices of those most directly impacted by the criminal system to be the voices and leaders in decarcerating America into this whole system of mass incarceration. So us being at the table, the work that I do through that is, man, it's like you, you talk about the narratives of the people, there's so many hundreds of thousands and millions of people that's been impacted by our criminal system and you see the devastation on each each and every day. It's not like, oh, it's an isolated incident here and isolated incidents there. It's like every single person you in contact has this hellacious story that'll make your, the hair grow back on your head and curl. It's, it's, it's crazy. And the, the impact of it is, is, it can't be overstated. I mean, I can't even give the impact of it enough. I don't have, I don't have the vocabulary to adequately explain it. Because but, I think, but I think, Ron, what you're saying in, um, is that, you know, Ruben's taking this one uh, person, Jimmy, and narrating him kind of deeply. But what we really have is collection, like collections of narratives, right? That is the data of mass incarceration, right? When we see these numbers, millions, et cetera, we, I think what, what we as social scientists do is we don't put humanity into those numbers to actually see what the stakes are. Exactly. And, um, and I and I and I think Ruben, I feel like there's this kind of biting critique that you are giving, at least in the segment that you read. There's a tiny bit of critique. You know, you're saying, oh, well, social disorganization scholars would say this. And yeah. And and and, and almost as though social science has kind of done a disservice to this entire research trajectory, which is actually people's humanity and suffering. And can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, sure. I, I think that that our, our terms are too flat to capture the lives and experiences of people. Yeah. I think too often we're looking for. Um, we're look, I feel I feel like we take. There, there are a lot of shortcuts that 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 we tend to take in, in the work to try to describe a whole lot of stuff. And I think that, um, it, and this is why I appreciate my my brother Ronald, who I'd like to say something about uh, it, uh, it, right right after this. But I think that. I think that our our the language that we use in, in social science, the, the 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 sociology of the urban poor specifically, the way we study study urban poor people, the way we study black people, um, we study them from a distance. We study them using terms that don't necessarily um, align with their experiences, and then we teach the people who we study to regurgitate this stuff right back at us through the media, through our intervention strategies. You know, et cetera. And so this is why, you know, in this segment, you know, I'm trying I'm trying to show how Jimmy begins talking to me. Jimmy begins talking to me 
using the language of treatment. Jimmy begins talking to me, uh, telling me stuff that he thinks I want to hear uh, because that's the cachet. And so I go with my survey in tow and with my cameras taking the same pictures over and over again of the same tenement buildings and the same toilets. This is from Sadia Hartman's beautiful work. Um, the same clothesline, she says, I keep taking these same pictures over and over again. And, I, and, and then I write policy based on these presumptions I have about who the so-called urban poor are, who the black poor are, what black life is. Um, but if I look at Jimmy, if I look at Jimmy's route into crime, you know, I don't just see his so-called route into crime. I, you know, on the one hand, we might talk about the poor decisions he makes. Well, those are the services he'll get. He'll get moral reckoning therapy. He'll get cognitive behavioral therapy on the inside. He'll get thinking for a change, something to help him think uh, about the way he feels about the social situation in which he's embedded or something like that. But if I look at Jimmy's route in the crime, then I'll talk about Jimmy's disorganized family. I'll, I'll, talk, about, I'll talk about his mother you know, from, from Moynihan up, but before that, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about his mother. I'll talk about the weakness of his family because his mother's raising these five kids without a daddy, without knowing that the daddy was there, without knowing that the thing I'm calling social disorganization reveals a particular kind of strength of, 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 of the men in that community. These are men from the so-called greatest generation, but not them. We can't look at them in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't look at them in that way. When I see Jimmy, I see environmental racism. I see his father dying from cancer. And I see a whole group of boys whose fathers died from cancer. And I, and I see a check that can't support him, not coming from Ford or GM, mm -hmm. from the Social Security office, $150 a month to raise five kids. What's he supposed to do with that? What's Jimmy supposed to do with that? Jimmy wants clothes like every other kid. Jim, Jimmy wants the nice things, the good shit, he says. And he deserves the good shit, by the way. And, and my response to Jimmy is to arrest him. Yeah. My response to Jimmy is to, is, is, is to see him steal the checks with his name on it and throw him in a cell. Well, by the time Jimmy does something wrong, actually, because that's not wrong, that was his check. That's my position. Yeah. Jimmy's stealing his own check. His name's on it. And he deserves gym shoes like everybody else. Mm -hmm. and, and by the time I arrest him for something that he actually does, when he does something wrong, now I say, see, Jimmy, you stole a check before you're a repeat offender. And I, and I, and I use this quote, history and pattern of criminality against him because I cannot see black life in this country in any way that's meaningful. And so what I wanna talk, what I want to talk about, you know, about, what I want to say about my brother Ronald, you know, Ronald was with me when we were doing this work. So Ronald, Jimmy was the brother who came in the office while you were interviewing his son. <laughs> Ronald was in the other office. Ronald was in the office interviewing his son. I was talking. I was in it anyway. J J J Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. So I want to talk about Ronald. That was a coincidence. That wasn't a coincidence. That was a, a neat thing. But I want to talk about Ronald for a hot second. The work that he does. So so he talks about you know um, uh, uh, the, the the important work of of bringing the like. Human, like bringing the humanity back in uh, to, to, to the ways that we see. And one of the things that Ronald does, and Ronald, I'd love for you to sort of vibe on this for a hot second, is, is what Ronald does is Ronald forces us to reckon with that deep humanity because Ronald forces us to make a place at the table for people who've been convicted of crimes because Ronald forces us to reckon with the truth that people aren't the worst mistake that they've made. People, people aren't the worst decision that they've made. So Ronald, if you, could, if you could talk just a little bit about um, uh, your advocacy starting uh, with the Lifers Project, really, like, like that, like what was the thing that drove you? Ronald started a, 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 life, a Lifers Project on the inside. He was one of the founders of Chance, Chance for Life, a, a nationally recognized uh, project for Lifers. And on the outside, he started something called the Good Neighbors Project. And I just want you to talk about um, uh, Nicole, if it's cool, you know, yeah. just sort of this, uh, this, you know, the, the thing that drove you to, to do this work. How did you do this work? Well, the, the Good Neighbor Project was it was it was a co-mentorship program that I started when I was working at an organization called American Friends Service Committee. Ruben was one of my board members, as a matter of fact. And the project was designed to connect people serving life and law and sentences with people in the community for a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. We call it a co-mentorship. Mm -hmm. It was basically a pen pal program on steroids because we had a, we, we had a, a whole bunch of topics to write about. It, it helped the person inside to be more reflective about what they did to harm the community. And it would help the community understand who's actually in prison and then have an impact on that person's life 
before they come home. And part of my motivation for that was back in 2001 on Father's Day, I had been in prison for about 16 years at the time. I was waiting for my 21 year old son and my three daughters to come visit my uh, other daughters. My son said, I talked to him that morning, hey dad, I'm coming to visit you and the children. You and the, I'm gonna bring the girls with you to come visit. So one o'clock, two o'clock comes and I no visits. I'm wondering where they are. I get on the phone and start calling around and couldn't find anybody. I, of all people, I called my ex-mother-in-law and asked that she's seen the kids. Hey, mom, this is Ronnie. How you doing? Have you seen the kids? She said, uh, you haven't heard? I said, no, what's going on? She said, little Ronnie's been shot and killed. My, my 21-year-old son had been shot and killed by a 14-year-old juvenile in Flint, in Flint, Michigan. I'm originally from Flint. And while I was in prison waiting for them to come visit. So by that time, I had become a, quite an advocate for people that's been in jail and prison. And so I advocated for the 14 year old juvenile to kill my son, not to be sent to prison in Michigan because they would give him life without parole the way Michigan was set up at the time. And I saw no useful purpose in giving this kid life without parole instead of giving him a second chance at life. And so I didn't want my son's death to be in vain. I said that my, my uh, advocating for the child to kill my child, to me, that was my first contribution to the restorative justice uh, principle. And I built the Good Neighbor Project on the principles of restorative justice. So my, my son was kind of impetus for the work that I did then and the work that I do now. Unbelievable. I, I am so sorry for that loss, but I think it, you know, that story, I, you know, it's so many of us think about what restorative justice is and we have that in principle, but you've, you've worked through that in practice. And I think to, 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 in some ways, practice those principles and to have it hit so deeply, you know, into your own personal life. I, you know, I think about this and I, this dialogue, I think about Du Bois and I've been going back to Du Bois and his original study when he was doing the Philadelphia Negro, he was, you know, a lot of what he was observing was based on his real experience. And I think in both of these, uh, both of your stories, I get kind of the real experience and how it kind of motivated both either the research for uh, Ruben or the activism uh, for Ron. So can you talk a little bit about that connection? So the, the kind of personal motives, as well as the, I think what we don't talk enough about, either faith or morality or the moral compass that drives you to do the things that you do. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. I mean, so, so my, um, I mean, my personal connection to the, to, to the story, and, and I, I wrestled with this in the book, is that my brother was, was locked up um, while I wrote the book. Um, and I was, I started off in this work before uh, my brother got in trouble. Um, uh, I, I was a volunteer chaplain at the Cook County Jail. I started in 2003, and it was a scripture that 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 drew me. Um, the scripture was uh, uh, Matthew 25, so-called Valley of Decision. It's 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 it's, it's where, where God makes a choice about which nations um, he, God will admit into the beloved. And, 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 and the criteria, our criteria of justice. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was sick, did you comfort me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? And that last part, in, in, the, in the version of scripture I read, sick and in prison ran together, which was striking, but, but, but did you visit me? Did you come to me? Did you make a place for me? Did you care for me? Did you love me? When I was at my worst, when I was, when I was miserable, uh, when I was the least of these, you know, and, and so that that touched me in a deep way, and it's it's it's, it's, it's what it's what drew me um, to the, to the work, and and I didn't want to pretend as if I didn't know from my flesh um, what it felt like to visit someone who had been to a jail or prison while I was writing this book, or 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 that I didn't know that it was my neighbors who I was ministering to, people I grew up with when I was a, when I was a volunteer chaplain. Or I didn't know that 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 could have been me, and I was arrested. It's 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 a, it's, a, it's you know for 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 nothing. I talk about this in the book. It was like bombing a wall, graffiti or whatever. But like, um, but 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 you know, it, it, it's not just my brother. It's it, it, brother. It's the two of them went to prison. My father did twenty years. Um, but but it, but it very it, it it very well could have been me, 
And I didn't want to pretend as if it couldn't. I wouldn't, I didn't want to pretend as if I wasn't born poor and black in Chicago, a residentially segregated city in a residentially segregated neighborhood um, after 1972 into the mass incarceration generation. And it was connecting with my brothers, mm -hmm. like my brother Ronald, you know, who 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 helped me do this work. You know, Ronald, Ronald, Ronald um, worked with me, and it was my honor to, to, to work with Ronald to collect data uh, for this project to to help me interpret this data. We'd be on the phone talking about some of the principles that 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 that, that, we, that showed up <laughs> that showed up in this in this in this book in powerful ways, and some of Ronald's stories is is in there too. But that's but it was. But what I didn't want to do was pretend as if I didn't have a kind of closeness, and I wanted to allow being close uh, to to the to the field, both people who I love, brother Ronald, my own my brother, my my blood brother, um, my own family and my own family experiences. Um, I wanted to, to 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 take that proximity, that closeness, and use it to reveal perhaps things that um, that scholars who decide not to allow their proximity to show up in their work, either that they don't see or refuse to write about. You know, and so and so, so that the, the things that 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 get uncovered once you once you begin to allow yourself that kind of proximity, once you once you once you allow yourself to to get close, um, not only in uh, the kind of work, the empirical and theoretical contributions that come up from that, I think I hope I offer something theoretically interesting. Uh, empirically interesting, I, you know, I think I do. We, we can certainly talk about what those contributions are if you'd like, you know, or folks to read well, whatever. And I, and I think, you know, you hit upon this, uh, you know, Ron, I'll let you in on this, like, um, it's probably insider baseball uh, uh, argument within sociology and other disciplines. They, they, when scholars of color study their own communities at times, they call it me search. And it's basically a racist term that devalues when black and brown scholars go in and study uh, these spaces and places intimately that they have they they have lived or <laughs> been abused by, and it's a way to diminish uh, diminish the scholar of color, but elevate a white person doing the same exact study, looking quote unquote heroic, um, studying. I'm gonna go go there like Joseph Conrad's The Savages, going going you know dark into the jungle, right? It, 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 you know, it, in some ways, I think uh, it's really um, just a terrible way that we've devalued what I think and what I was trying to get at what Du Bois would say is how does the personal lead to the right empirical questions, right? And, you know, it, it's living, you know, he, Du Bois didn't just study the seventh ward. He lived in the, you know, in the seventh ward. Yeah, but you and, know, and, something that's yeah. to think about though, Nicole is, is also how you do it. So, so, right, so this, right. and this isn't a, this isn't a, you know, uh, this, the, 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 the great name of, of, of Du Bois, uh, the patron saint of, of, of black scholarship. But if you read on Negro criminality, it reads like every other white scholar study in black people. And so it's, 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 yep. it's also very, you know what I mean? It's also very important uh, that, 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 we, that we don't buy into the hype, you know, right. it's idea hype man. Um, writes about Du Bois as a wayward Puritan yeah. in, 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 in wayward lives. You know, it's, it's like all this stuff gets in the way of, of his, of, 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 of it, it, especially early Du Bois, all this stuff gets in the way um, of, of his assessment of, 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 of black life. And that can happen to the best well-meaning black scholars. We could, we could jump into the field looking for something like empathy, but if we don't challenge the tools of the trade that otherize, that, 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 that cause us to distance ourselves from the so-called other, and if we if we don't and it, it, it even even the ways we write, you know, often we write about uh, the people we study to explain to the 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 specialist in the field or the generalist social scientist or the generalist audience. If I'm a journalist, in other words, to explain to normal people. But Toni Morrison says, "I'm gonna write about black people for black people to black people." Yes. So, so there's not all these explanations going on. You know, it's interesting. I had this whole like um, wrestling match uh, when I, when I uh, there, there's a section in the in the book in chapter two where I talk about bombing a wall, and there was a whole discussion about whether or not I should explain what bombing is, or if I should allow it to come out in the context for people who aren't aware. But this this is exact. But this is exactly the framework, right? Like 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 like, am I explaining to the safe 
You know, am I explaining to the academy? Am I explaining to the, the public? Am I explaining to normal people the lives of the other, the savage? It doesn't matter if I'm black, if I'm doing that, I'm You're reading doing the, same. the same stuff over and over, and over again. Absolutely. And I think, and, and that is the core of the, the critique. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask this to both of you. So I'm going to go there with the critique of the discipline itself. So I'm going to say there's a whole field that to me is a fake field. It's called re-entry. And re-entry is a word that criminologists love. They love studying re-entry and they have tests and they, they make it sound as though you actually could re-enter the society after you've been incarcerated or marked in some way. Let's just pretend you've been in, you weren't incarcerated and you were put on probation for a small violation. I feel that re-entry is one of these words that we are forced to use because we have no other language, but I don't think that re-entry is the word. Can you both speak to it? Uh, maybe let's let Ron start with your activism and then Ruben will talk about the research. Ron, what do you think? Re-entry, is it a word that's real and should we be using it? A couple of things. I mean, I, I want to re re circle back real quickly and speak to Bru Ruben's process of engagement. You know, you talked about, I think his, the way he engages, is uh, it gives him a level of authenticity that a, a lot of other scholars don't have. And, and when people don't have your level of authenticity and they try to come up with these superficial ways to demean your work, you know, <laughs> like you, you talked about, you know, studying my own community is, is, is me search, you know, that's, re that's ridiculous. <laughs> so I think, you know, Ruben brings a level of authenticity that many other scholars don't have because the way he approaches the work, number one. Number two, by re-entry, it is one of those, you know, those catchphrases, those words that's been created and thrown out there and bandied about in a bunch of different ways. And I don't know if I'm so caught up on redefining it more so than redefining the work that what re-entry actually looks like, because re-entry for our community looks different than re-entry in the white community. I was looking at the question in the in the chat yeah. box about the person yeah. wanted to juxtap juxtapose Judeo Christianity and as, as a re as it uh, applies to law enforcement in prisons. And it, it applies the same way as racism applies. Who's worthy of receiving it? <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. So I think re-entry is along the same line. The re-entry is, is good for those who deem worthy to receive it and give them all these programs and stuff that they to make them successful. And you come to the black community, re-entry is a dirty word because you know we don't get any of those support service, services. And we get marginal services. And then we get 48,000 collateral consequences on top of those marginal services that we have to overcome. So it's yeah. it's an uphill battle. Yeah. It's re-entry for some very yeah. small population, yeah. but not for most. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So Ruben, what, what say you on, on that term? Is it one of those terms that allow that that then makes us participate the way Du Bois maybe would have participated in that basically that white criminology that obscures. Uh, racial violence. Yeah, it's yeah, it's 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 such a great it's such a great question. Ronald is always on time, brother. Like like this is this this is this is one of the reasons why I so appreciate um, our, our 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 years together because he's always pushing, always challenging, um, and and always reminding us to to, to sort of do the work, but also just you, you operate at such a high intellectual level. Like there, there's no discussion that you can't participate. I, anyway, I don't have to keep talking about my brother. Uh, but but, but, <laughs> but what, I, what I will say is on this re-entry tip, you're right. It's like, it's been so narrowly defined and understood. And then, and then we end up fighting over these definitions of, of, of what it is. And one of the reasons why in the book I talk about this is the afterlife of mass incarceration, because I'm not just talking about re-entry, first of all, um, uh, th 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 we can't presume a linearity. We can't presume that someone gets out of prison and comes back home. By the time my guys, the folks in our sample, the work that me and Ronald did, by the time that um, uh, we, you know, we met them after prison, most had been to prison before, most had been to prison multiple times, most had been arrested multiple times. And then reentry from what? Like, what are we counting as carceral institution? Well, if we, if we, if we, if we keep the sort of more Foucaultian notion of the carceral, uh, 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 up front, we'll think about the ways that, you know, prison-like logics filter into schools, child welfare, education, et cetera. But, but let's think about the kinds of things that we don't talk enough about in the literature. Where's the work on group homes mm -hmm. and, 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 and what it means to come home from it? It's narrowly located in the child welfare field, right? Like, like very narrowly defined, defined as child welfare scholars define it uh, with very limited engagement 
uh, in the criminological discourse. Let's let 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 let's think about places like Job Corps, where almost everybody, like all three of us, grew up in the hood on this call, right? So like, right, like we we all anyway. So so like so 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 like all of us know somebody who went to Job Corps. And what did John Cord do for you, right? Like these things are 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 ways that we frame the problem, and then our responses to the problem uh, uh, are, are are follow this 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 narrow framing. What the narrow framing suggests is that what you need is a service. The problem at the end of the day is you, right? And so and so and so and so reentry programs do wonderful work to the extent that they can do it. So a reentry program will provide a place to stay temporarily if it's if it's a really advanced, wonderfully working, the most efficacious of them. The ones that, that show in the literature that they're most successful provide people with a place to stay. Um, but the problem is you can intervene with that person for six months, maybe even a year or three. But what you can intervene in from an organizational standpoint is, is the housing market, which refuses to allow people with criminal records to rent apartments. You can intervene uh, in, 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 in someone's ability to tie a tie, write a resume, get prepared for the worlds of work. But what the reentry program cannot do is intervene in the labor market. It can't prepare the worlds of work for the person who might enter it. And so, and so, and so, and so, what, so what we need is intervention, if we're, since we're talking about, uh, well, I don't know if we've yet talked about interventions, but just to go there, if we need interventions at the level of citizenship. Yeah. The, the question is a problem of belonging. The, the, right, so the, we create a world in which, this is at least my argument, what I argue in the book, what, what I come down to, because Ronald pushes me constantly in chapters one, three, eight, right? like, like in this book. Anyway, uh, but, but what, 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 what Ronald does is push me to think about making a world in which people belong. You know, he, he pushes me to think more carefully, more critically uh, about the world that we've made that exclude. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we got to crack this, 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 this nut, this problem of, of social exclusion and, and think and think more carefully about belonging. I think that's the that's the real work. That's the, so does is reentry the right word? You know, maybe or maybe not. Is is reentry the right way to approach this question? Absolutely not. Is the framing is 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 the wrong kind of framing to address the problem that we're looking at? And I, you know, so yes to all of that. Yes to all that interventions in the field of citizenship. But here's here's the kicker. Only because I've studied courts, and so I would see people getting the VOPs, which are violation of probations, right? You're finally out and here comes the next, here comes recidivism. Here comes another term, recidivism. Mm -hmm. Well, recidivism is just merely getting arrested again. We automatically imply, well, you must have done something wrong. Here's some of the things that I saw happen. A man waiting for a bus stop on a rainy day in Chicago, he moved close to a building to not be rained on and they uh, arrested him for some kind of vagrancy style law that you know he was in the Lincoln Park and they didn't like him there. They, and, and he was going back to jail for that. Uh, a young man fleeing gangs, he's not about allowed to be near a, affiliated gang members, which is almost like how many people hey, in his neighborhood. <laughs> they start chasing him because he's disaffiliated. He runs into a vacant building to hide. What happens? Trespassing charge, he's pulled in. I, I guess the question for me is, is there any hope when you could get rested waiting for the bus stop to get to the job that you need to have to not violate the probation? Yeah. You could have a million of these interventions to in the fields of citizenship, you are still being hunted. We're, we, people are still being hunted. Well, what, what do we do? You, you bring up a good point. And one of the main, one, the point you bring up is one of the major problems with risk assessments. Mm -hmm. Because our communities are so over policed, we come in contact with the with law enforcement at a much earlier age. So, in a risk assessment that they use it to prejudge a person's future dangerousness based on you know, upon them being released from jail or prison, if it's based on the first time they came in contact with the police system, then they're automatically going to be high risk because our our communities are over policed. So that we always going to have that issue. We're always going to have that problem of being over policed. And being subject to being arbitrarily, mm -hmm. you know, subject to the laws and whims of those that enforce it. So reentry becomes a joke because of that, and recidivism becomes a joke because of that. Because you, if you're in an over police community, you're gonna come in contact with the police right. again, and that's one of your requirements for parole: no contact with law enforcement. If you go back to the same community, that's impossible. 
Yeah. Almost impossible. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a recreation of the wheel. It keeps recreating itself over and over and over. And it's operating as it was designed to operate. So like I always tell Ruben, the work that I do, I try to go out and do heart and mind change because you can change policy all day long. The legislature can change any policy they want, but we see with a stroke of a pen, they can rescind a president or a governor or whoever comes into power can rescind whatever, the, whatever law was passed. So we need to have heart and mind change in our communities if um, reform is ever going to be sustainable. Absolutely. Ruben, he, we, we have an argument about that all the time, but I'm going to stick by my guns, Ruben. we got to have heart and mind change. Well, just so that for the audience uh, that are that are tuning in, thank you so much. We see some of these questions coming up. So the panelists, we can, we can actually see it. So um, Ron, thank you for answering or addressing one of the first questions. Um, and But keep questions coming in. We have about 10 more minutes to go. Um, the, there is a question here um, from Kim Wright King about black love and black families seem to be an existential threat to white supremacy since the 1440s. Um, and they go on to ask, how do we unpack, address and undergo multi-generational recovery to truly thrive? I think what's profound, Ruben, as you already mentioned, you're interviewing Jimmy and Ron's interviewing his son and you just see generations of either trauma or, uh, you know, just the, the profound consequences of violence um, yeah. on, yeah. on, you know, on these men and young boys. So what do you think about that intergenerational effect? Yeah, I think that's pretty deep. I think um, uh, 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 Kim Wright King is also asking us to think about um, like, like the intergenerational long historic context, starting with really the moment of encounter. I try to do that um, and think carefully about for example, the production of black people. Um, so black people get made, black people get made, uh, I, I argue, and not just me, I mean, I'm trying to stick in kind of the, the Africana sort of black world studies tradition here and think about the ways that black people get made um, at the moment of colonial encounter. So, 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 mm -hmm. so the Portuguese, for example, are gonna run into uh, folks from a number of different tribes uh, they're gonna the, the, the folks who are enslaved are the people who are captured from 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 uh, you know that, that 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 have basically lost wars and are and are and are being brought uh, uh, from 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 other villages. These are these are these are very different kinds of people um, that all get homogenized uh, as 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 a kind of undifferentiated, mm -hmm. lawless, godless, um, naked mass uh, of uh, that, that get called black much later, but 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 black people. My argument is that black people get made in this moment, and they get made. One of the mechanisms through which they get made is is violence, the label of violence, mm -hmm. because of the revolts, uh, uh, at, at, because the relationship is a relationship of capture. And at every moment, there's a revolt. At every moment, you come to me to put chains on me. I'm gonna fight back anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so and so and so, I think this point that Ronald raises about the heart and mind change is so very important. I used to read this as Pollyannish. You know, Ronald and I talk about this all the time. I used to be like, hearts and minds, and I, I come on, man. It's it's the law. The law is the driver. The law is the engine. Social policy is doing this. These are racist policies that are that are, that are, that, are, that, are, that are making things happen, and the law is the engine of the kinds of problems that we see. And and even hearts and minds change often change perceptions in the law. But 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 this point that that he raised already, which bears repeating, and and, and the reason for um uh uh. Uh, uh, the, the heart and mind change work, which I think happens through cultural production, mm -hmm. which includes writing, songs, poetry, art of all kinds, scholarship, right? Like the, like the, the, the cultural production is, is the thing that's gonna help us. I'm not saying that you don't change law, you must. Uh, you know, uh, you must, we can't, we can't have too many more Tamir Rices, right? We, 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 can't, we, can't, we can't allow for that. We, we have to do all that we can to stop that in the now, but to prevent that from happening again, when people forget the atrocity of Tamir Rice, we have to do the cultural work of, of, of changing the way people understand themselves in relation to the other, the way the other is produced, the, the deep historical work that happened in, for example, Black Studies programs, Africana Studies programs, Latino and Latina and Chikina, uh, Chik, uh, Chicano Studies programs, all across uh, 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 areas, so-called area studies programs, uh, all, all across the universities, the very kinds of programs that 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 are always facing the axe, the things that are always getting cut, 
are the things that we need most so that so that we can so that we can think about uh, the, the, the the deep historical resonances of the ways in which the, the ways that um, one is being treated in a given moment in time and how that links up with, with you know with with, 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 a, with a much longer with, with, with a longer historical narrative so so the the, the heart and mind change is is, is exceptionally important um, because we've got to get people to see us for whom we are now having said that, I think that the move is not to uh, when, when Ronald talks about heart and mind change, um, I don't think he means anything about the way people feel. And I, 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 uh, Ronald, I, uh, I'm, 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 I'm sort of waxing on, on, your, on your ideas, but, but just allow me to. Um, Ronald is talking about creating a place where there's, at least I think you are, and maybe you talk more about this in our waning minutes, where we make a deep ethical commitment one to another. So if you're afraid of me or not, if you got love for me or not, if you think I'm human or not, the, the point is to write law and policy from such a way where you pretend like you think that. You write law and policy as if you believed it, because I am, whether you feel that way or not. A heart and mind, the heart and mind change is an ethical commitment where we write law and policy from the position of what's right and what's wrong. That's the place of intervention. It's a moral intervention. It's an ethical intervention. It, it, it's, it's not just an intervention in, in, in a specific set of rules and regulations that guide a particular historical moment. What if we change the frame a little bit? I'm just curious about this part, changing hearts and minds. I think about this. What if we were allowed to see the system for its violence? And by that, I mean, we stop gazing at the victimization and look at the racist intention of the discretionary actors, the policymakers. And we we also study up. You know, I've, I've kind of thought about this. You know, one thing about this book, uh, Ruben, is that it doesn't just gaze upon people suffering. It's you are connecting the dots. As I started saying, this is structural racism, right? There is a racist intent that is cascading over and over that routes this boy into prison. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I think especially social scientists, they don't, they don't gaze up and say, I, you know, here is the intent of that system. And I think in hearts and minds, I, I have to say many people have now said to me, mostly white people that have not experienced the type of policing that's happening in black and brown communities. They said, I had no clue. I, I just didn't understand. Or they say to me, I didn't understand police could lie. I didn't understand until I saw Eric Gardner beg for his life or, or, or George Floyd beg for his mom and his life. Is there something about the hearts and minds of exposing the violence and doing it over and over and over again? Ron, would that fit to this, this idea? It's part of the answer. I mean, you, you have to get the story out there and, and unless people are confronted with it, they, it's easy for them to, do, to you know, ignore it. You know, right. NIMBY, not in my, if it's not in my backyard, I have to right. pay any attention to it. So, but if you put it in their face constantly, like you've been seeing the last few years, last four or five years, especially, there's been a lot more coverage of it. It's been in your face, in your face, in your face. It's impossible to ignore. Right. I mean, we have some, we, there are some people that ignore it now because we right. saw what happened on, on January the 6th. And a lot of people will right. ignore, they will ignore the uh, violence and stuff that's committed against black and brown people, not just in, in the prison system, but in general, because that level of violence is used to perpetuate mm -hmm. the system the way it go. Cause they say, oh, if you look, you see how violent and, and dangerous they are. So we have to have more police, more prisons, more, more, more right. oppression. So they use the violence to their benefit. Right. And Ruben, what do, you, what do you say? Is there a way of changing hearts and minds through exposing the system? Well, that's what I hope. I mean, there, there is some work that says, um, you know, for example, having, to be made to watch the video of black suffering, like these videos over and over again have like negative mental health um, effects on, 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 on poor people, you know, and, and there's a whole resistance to what people are calling like poverty porn and mm -hmm. this kind of thing. And uh, I, 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 I understand and appreciate that all the time. Um, but I do think that you have to confront reality mm -hmm. and, and it's ugly, it's, 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 it's not pretty. It's ugly. What's what's beautiful are the lives that people are able to make yeah. for themselves within enclosure, within all the things that press down around and against them, within uh, the, the 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 encroachment of systems of destruction, and 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 I think we have to think about intent for sure, 
And I think we also have to think about inertia too. So what does it mean for a thing to just be moving, for us to have had a world designed in the way in which it's been designed for so long? It makes it very hard to think outside of it. This is one of the questions about uh, abolitionism. I'm gonna answer this, uh, I'm gonna respond to this. Um, I think abolition is, is incredibly important. I'm not an abolitionist. I have you know, reasons for that that I'm happy to you know, discuss. Um, uh, 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 but it's not because I think abolition is just pie in the skies. I have other reasons. I have other, you know, ethical, you know, commitments and thoughts about, you know, what's right and what's wrong uh, in, in, in my own life and the lives of the people I care for and, and, and what I think about this country and whether or not I want a nation state. I, there are a hundred reasons I can have a conversation about why I'm not an abolitionist. Uh, but having said that, the, the project of abolition is, is the most important project, I think, in, in, in of, of certainly of the decade, uh, if, if not the century. The idea is to imagine a world in which we don't need jails or prisons and to build society anew, to, 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 to create institutions, new kinds of life-giving institutions that, that take the place of the death-dealing institutions of, 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 of punishment, coercion, control, and the kind of force that we exert uh, to address our social problems. I think I think that's real. I think it requires us to imagine outside of this 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 this, this system that 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 we that we've been drawn into. And this is also a part of the reason why the 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 my research method is the way it is. It's like getting close. It's like no, let's 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 think differently about how to ask questions and which questions to ask and how to answer them and what counts as 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 science and what counts as 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 truth and and, and how we understand that truth. This isn't to say there is no truth. I don't. I don't. I don't believe in in in, in some like relativist sort of move where where obviously obviously like I'm a social scientist. I, you know, I, I I believe that you can count things. I think that there, there, there's room for that. I think there's room for quantifying stuff too. Uh, but 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 the point is there are other ways to know and to be in the world, and we need to explore them. And and, and to be able to explore them, we need to, we need to sort of release our imaginations in that way. And this is where the heart and mind change comes in. You know, uh, somebody like Ronald forces us to reckon with, and this is where reckoning with the violence of the system comes in. A brother like Ronald forces us to reckon with the violence of the system. What Ronald didn't tell you is that the, the charge that he went to prison for was a charge he didn't do. He didn't tell you that because Ronald doesn't care about guilt or innocence in the same ways that other people does. He, he won't tell you that, I'm gonna tell you that. I'm gonna tell you he was up in there innocent. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you that as, as, as his friend. And and, 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 and and then for that tragedy to, to befall him, and then for him, from the ethical commitment that he made to advocate for that boy, that's what justice looked like. Yes. And, and, and that's hard. And that requires a, a kind of moral imagination that sees that boy who caused harm as being worthy of having a place in the world. It didn't matter whether or not Ronald loved the boy. And I don't want to sort of dwell here, but I just, I just want to make that point. Like, like Ronald, let, let me, and just, and just my last comment about Ronald. Ronald is one of our nation's great men. He just is. Thank you, Ruben. And we throw away so many of our great men. We would not have a Ronald if Ronald didn't, with, 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 with six uh, 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 typewriters, and a bunch of law clerks take on the state of Michigan and win. We, we, would, we wouldn't have a Ronald. How many great men have we lost? How many great women have we lost? Yes. How many of our great LGBTQ brothers and sisters have we locked away disproportionately, by the way? Yes. Uh, and Jeff, how many Native Americans have we murdered and, 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 and never said a word about it? Yes. Because our imaginations are locked. In, in, in one particular way. And that's what abolition offers us. Abolition offers us a reimagination of this thing, whether or not, whether or not um, I agree with the project of abolition itself uh, or the tenets of it or whatever, I'm saying that this reimagination, this radical reimagination, this radical rethinking of what justice is and what it should be and what our role and relationship with each other should be, what our commitment to each other should be, that's, that's, that's where it's at for me right now. Uh, in, in my thinking, but I think I think that's that's the thing that's going to get us to a better world, and that's the that's the hearts and minds. I think that that my brother Ronald, you can speak for yourself, but that, that that to me is is that's where you push me when you talk about hearts and minds. Yeah. 
And I, I think I think what's most profound that we all need to think about is that when you say there are great men and women locked up all over the world, it, I walked into the Greaterford Prison in Pennsylvania where they have a, a, a lifers program. Uh, the men are activists. They are changing the world from the inside. And I, I always would leave Greaterford thinking, what could they do if they were outside? Like what would what could they contribute and change if they were just outside? And I think that, I think, you know, that's the one level. The second level is we assume everybody that's in jail or prisons are guilty. And, right. and one of the things that I have uh, suggested is that there is mass wrongful conviction in the criminal justice system, that the numbers we understand as mass incarceration are mass wrongful conviction on a scale that we just don't understand. And I think that to me really shifts the, the, this kind of autopilot to just convict and punish at all costs, right? And Ron, I think you're a testament to that. I'm sure there's many people that you've talked to that you couldn't necessarily free, but you knew that they may, been, they have, may have been innocent. Was that, was that the case? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I still, I've been home for almost nine years now, and I still got a handful of guys that I'm working on their cases for them because I believe absolutely that they're innocent. One guy, physically impossible for him that committed the crime they charged him of because of his physical handicap. And so, so yes, there's a lot of people in prison that, you know, that shouldn't be there because they're actually innocent. Yeah. And you, you talked about, you know, my particular case, I was in for 27 years on a wrongful conviction, got my conviction overturned, but there are lots and lots and lots of people in there. And I think you mentioned earlier about the wrongful conviction numbers those numbers are just the tip of the iceberg. And it's not that we don't understand them. We don't want to face them right. because they're, they're so horrendous. If we, we actually face the reality of how many people are actually in jails and prison wrongfully, we would cut the prison population in half. I, my work would be done. Right, <laughs> so. right, right. And I, and I think to me that, that, that lends itself to this larger picture. We see policing where they're administering the death penalty without due process. We see the courts that's cutting corners and promising people uh, the truth and due process and they're getting nothing. Promising representation and they're doing nothing. And then we see the final place, which is we uh, free people, promising them freedom, promising them a start, a fresh start. And what we see is, um, Ruben, your, your profound account of how punishment just keeps following you home in the cyclical pattern. Where, where's the final note that we can, I think Ruben, you said it best, we have to reimagine a system. What is the most optimistic uh, vision that we should take away? I think, um, I, I think that the, the problem of, and it could be larger than this, but I think the problem of mass incarceration is a problem of citizenship. And I think that because citizenship at the end of the day is about belonging, it's about uh, being a fully human participant in a human community, and being able to move and operate within a human community, a political community, meaning how power flows or something like that. And so, and so, and so I think the point of this is that um, we will get to a brighter way, a brighter future, um, if we begin to, 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 to um, operate from a place in which we try to make the world, uh, where we try to make the world a world where people belong, even people who've harmed us. So the question for me, what I've come down to, um, and, and uh, is that is that really we asked the wrong question. We asked questions about public safety. You know, what what do I need to do to be made safe? I think if we ask questions about belonging, we ask questions about human thriving, right? If we if we ask questions about uh, uh, well being, how to promote the well being of people who have harmed us and people who have uh, 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 been the victims of harm, who have been harmed. We asked about thriving, we asked about well-being, we'll get to a place of safety. And so, and so, so the optimism that I have come from uh, the work that people uh, who have been directly impacted by the system are doing, uh, it forcing us uh, to reckon with their deep and beautiful humanity uh, and, 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 and forcing the world uh, uh, to, to, to write itself. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that, that's where I find hope. 
Uh, that, that's, that's where my optimism, if, if there's some optimism to gain from this, that's where it comes from. And, and that's, that's, that's what I think we need. I think we need an imagination of human thriving to focus on thriving. And I, and I think that's what, that's what the folks who I meet who have been directly impacted and who are changing the world, I think, I think that's what they're doing. Well, this has been an amazing conversation that I just feel honored to have been a part of. I wanna thank our two speakers. I wanna thank uh, Professor Ruben Miller. I wanna thank uh, Ronald Simpson Bay. It's really just been uh, an honor to be with you both. I wanna thank the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice and the series, This is America. Um, our director, uh, Professor Tony Bogues. And I wanna just take two seconds and why don't we just thank the people and the spirits that are, are profiled in this book. So many people shared their stories and I'm so grateful that they were able to uh, you know, tell their stories to, to Ruben so we can understand them and see their humanity. And for all of them, uh, we really honor you tonight. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Be well, everybody. Be well.